A secret government special weapons development program finds its test pilot and a daredevil police officer injured in the crossfire of a drug smuggling operation that leads back to the top of the very police department he was working for. In a world of corruption and motorcycles on both sides of the law, who will ride the center line dispensing justice for all? Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the History of Street Hawk. Hawk was a 13-episode live-action television series that originally ran on ABC in the United States from January to May of 1985, and later on networks in 42 countries around the world. Jesse Mock loves two things, action and being a cop. But sometimes those two things are incompatible when an Evil Knievel-style motorcycle stunt results in a two-week suspension for both Jesse and his partner, they turn to racing to fill the void. During one Marty. particular race against each other through the desert, they stumble upon a drug smuggling operation that lands Jesse in the hospital with extensive injuries and his partner murdered. But it's not all bad news. Jesse's motorcycle stunt show that got him suspended in the first place was witnessed by Norman Tuttle, the main research engineer for the Street Hawk program. Despite his reservations about Jesse's mental and physical fitness, he signs him to the program with a promise of rehabilitation, action, and federally backed vigilante justice. By day, Jesse will still be Jesse Mock, mild-mannered police officer reassigned to the public relations division using a cane, walking with a limp. But by night and day when necessary, he is the mysterious black-clad pilot of an experimental prototype all-terrain pursuit vehicle. He is, the bike is, the program is, they are, codename Street Hawk. And now it's time for a game of Is It Night Rider? Round one, a brutally injured cop recruited for a top secret vehicle-based vigilante law enforcement weapons program. The question is, is it Knight Rider? No, Michael Knight and Jesse Mock were both cops rebuilt by their respective vigilante law enforcement teams, but Knight Rider gets a whole new face and identity. Street Hawk gets his knee repaired and keeps his day job as a cop. Could not be more different. Round two, Knight Rider's kit and Street Hawk's Street Hawk are basically just the same thing, except one's a car and the other's a motorcycle. Is it Knight Rider? No, it's, it's not. Kit is an actual artificial intelligence with its own identity. Michael and Kit are like teammates, partners who can function independent of each other. Street Hawk is a highly advanced prototype vehicle that's operated by a rider. By itself, Street Hawk the bike can't do anything without Street Hawk the pilot. Final round, they're both pursuing justice wherever that path takes them with or without the help of law enforcement and sometimes against law enforcement. They're both vigilantes. Is it Knight Rider? No, no. See, Knight Rider is a public law enforcement operation backed by a mysterious billionaire. There's only one kit and one Michael Knight. Street Hawk is a federally funded weapons development program that, if successful, will be rolled out to every police department around the country. They could not be more different. All right, that's it for this edition of Is It Knight Rider? Be sure to join us next time for Is It Airwolf? Street Hawk was created by Paul M. Bellows, Robert Walterstorff, and Bruce Lansbury as a Lime Kiln and Templar production in association with Universal Television. While it feels like it could have been a Glenn A. Larson production, it was not. Bruce Lansbury in particular had a deep television background, having worked on the 1960s series Wild Wild West and then Mission Impossible after that. Wonder Woman, The Fantastic Journey, and even contributions to The Brady Bunch, Happy Days, The Odd Couple, and not for nothing, in the 90s he would end up producing Murder, She Wrote, starring his sister, Angela Lansbury. Originally intended to be called Falconer, the production team had to stay flexible. Turns out there was already a pilot in the works with that title. But what's in a name? That which we call a hawk by any other name would ride just as street. 
But then Streethawk was too close to Nighthawk, and that landed them a $250 million lawsuit from Honda. Honda wanted to protect the brand value of their Nighthawk motorcycle, and only agreed to drop the lawsuit after the show was canceled. Streethawk was originally intended to premiere on primetime Monday nights at 8 p.m. at the end of 1984 as opposed to the beginning of 1985, but ABC accidentally found themselves with a surprise performer in the drama Call to Glory starring Craig T. Nelson about a U.S. Air Force pilot and his family, meaning that Streethawk became a mid-season replacement Friday nights at 9 p.m. instead. Streethawk the motorcycle itself in show is an all-terrain attack motorcycle designed to fight urban crime capable of incredible speeds up to 300 miles an hour and immense firepower. In show, it cost $3 million. In reality, as with any stunt-driven show, lots of individual motorcycles were built for the purpose that they would be used in the show. Bikes with better suspensions for jumps, bikes that were more about the details and lights for appearances during the close-up camera work. Multiple bikes needed to be on hand so the production could continue while other bikes were being repaired. The crew kept six different bikes on hand at all times. Jesse Mock was played by Rex Smith. Rex began his acting career on Broadway in the cast of Grease in 1978. He was a teen heartthrob featured regularly in magazines like Tiger Beat and Sixteen Magazine. His career was on a musical path, including a top 10 song in 1979 called You Take My Breath Away. Norman Tuttle, Street Hawk's designer and engineer, Jesse's co-pilot, navigator, and all-around Alfred back at the control center was played by Joe Riggle-Buto. You might recognize him from his later role as Frank Fontana on the television show Murphy Brown. Lieutenant Commander Alto Belli was played by Richard Venture, and Rachel Adams was played by Jeannie Wilson. Rex wasn't the first choice for Jesse Mock. Don Johnson was originally considered, but he landed Miami Vice. George Clooney screen tested, and creator Robert Walterstorff liked him, but ABC said no. However, Clooney does appear in the second episode. Twelve years later, Clooney would get another chance at a superhero without any superpowers, which was still eight years after Rex was the first person to portray Marvel's Daredevil in the TV movie The Trial of the Incredible Hulk. Superheroes love two things, action and selling toys. While there were plans by Kenner to release Street Hawk related toys in the US, almost none of them were produced. A Street Hawk command center with motorcycle launching action was in development. It would have been compatible with three different bikes, Street Hawk, Stunt Bike, and Police Cycle, each with a removable figure with construction similar to Star Wars. A Street Hawk friction-powered cycle was produced by Kenner and most likely distributed by Palatoy in the UK where the piece is more commonly found. LJN produced a Street Hawk motorcycle with lights and motorized action as part of their Rough Riders line. In Brazil, Street Hawk was retitled Moto Laser. Glass Leap, based out of Brazil, released a motorcycle and a Chevy truck similar to the one that ran over Jesse Mock in the pilot episode. Not cool, Zeus. Not cool. There was a racing track with Street Hawk and a stunt bike and a Jesse Matt individually carded action figure whose blister card back features all the members of the A team and Michael Knight. Ertl produced and may or may not have released in some quantity a voice-activated role-play helmet set. MPC released a model kit of Jesse's yellow 1969 Ford Mustang. Empire Model Kits in Japan released a Street Hawk kit. Rainbow Toys produced two different versions of their Street Hawk motorcycle, one with and one without helmet-shaped launcher, but the true gem of Street Hawk toys was the one with ties to G.I. Joe, released in India and the UK by Fun School. Fun School was a manufacturer founded in India in 1987. They produce licensed merchandise from companies like Hasbro and Disney. When it comes to G.I. Joe, they are known for quirky repaints, parts swapping, and repackaging. Access to the G.I. Joe molds allowed them to produce a G.I. Joe Ram motorcycle in black with metallic silver decals and call it Street Hawk. The blister card is even branded as G.I. Joe, likely to tie it into the debut of the line and its popularity in India at the time. For the initial release, Fun School repainted an original Snake Eyes figure with silver accents as a stand-in for Jesse Mock. Successive releases in India and limited other international markets would see Snake Eyes replaced with a Target figure, again with silver accents, a much more accurate representation of the helmet and costume on the show. 
A third version had the target head on a spearhead body, again with silver accents, a glorious attempt that not only does its best to provide fans of the show with an official version of the thing that they watched on TV at almost no additional cost to fun school, but also an exciting new variant for G.I. Joe collectors around the world. Lunch boxes, binoculars, puzzles, activity books, there was quite a bit of merchandise released, including a video game by Ocean Software for the ZX Spectrum. The pilot episode was adapted into a novel by Target Books in Britain, as were three pairs of episodes for a total of four books. And if you don't want to read with your eyes, there were Street Hawk books on tape. Speaking of tapes, the pilot episode was released on VHS in Canada and the US by MCA. Strangely enough, the two edits are different, both in terms of runtime and visual effects. The Canadian version has red lasers, where the US version has blue lasers. In 2010, Shout Factory, for the 25th anniversary, released the complete series on DVD. The set included a new documentary called The Making of a Legend, and an unaired pilot with different Street Hawk weapon effects. And you can purchase the entire series in standard definition via Amazon.com. Street Hawk didn't have the same impact that its contemporaries did. Forever compared to Knight Rider, it gets lost in the haze of other primetime superheroes, detectives, private investigators, vigilantes, and soldiers of fortune. It did have a second, a longer life outside the US. And thanks to this infernal internet that simultaneously brings fandoms together while it rips the rest of the world apart, the fan base has grown since it left the broadcast airwaves, to the point where in 2010 Rex Smith himself was actively lobbying to bring the series back in a legacy capacity similar to Knight Rider's return to television in 2008. Street Hawk got decent ratings, but ultimately twas scheduling that killed the Hawk. Opposite Dallas on Friday nights was a tough ask for television viewers, especially the demographics they would have needed to pull to keep the advertising money coming in. Street Hawk as a technical stunt and effects driven show was also very expensive. The kind of show that a studio won't give a second season unless they really, really believe in it. Given the choice between Knight Rider and Street Hawk, viewers chose to stick with the talking car they knew over the motorcycle they just met. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber, thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toy galaxy or become a YouTube channel member. Both Patreon and YouTube channel membership have the same exclusive content, so choose your own adventure. Pause a beat. Wait for the teleprompter to catch up. Please share this video. <laughs> Let us know in the comments down below. If you'd be interested in the Vigilante Justice Machine television universe, it would bring together Knight Rider, Street Hawk, and Airwolf. We gotta clear up some rights issues, make all these studios play nice together. But if we do this right, we might even be able to get Auto Man in the auto car and the Viper from Viper. It's the Ocean's Eleven of the parking lot. How could it fail? <laughs> Cut.